I'd really encourage people to just look at the green spaces and the blue spaces and see what's close by and go out and have an adventure, go out and explore and discovering for ourselves what our favourite habitat is, how we feel in a woodland, how we feel in a wetland, what it's like to be in uh, open rolling hills. It really does lift the soul. Welcome to Waterlands, a series brought to you by the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. I'm Roxy Furman, a zoologist and filmmaker. In this series, I'll be exploring some of the watery places that once covered the land, through the stories of people and wildlife that have been shaped by them. Today, I'm in the city exploring the wetlands on our doorsteps. Humans are now officially an urban species, with over half of us living in cities. I love the possibility and excitement that comes with being in the city, but I also long to watch a flock of geese soar across a windy estuary, or hear the rush of waves drowning out my thoughts. Like humans across the centuries, I'm drawn to wetlands. Cities and wetlands are intertwined in many different ways. Most urban centres developed because of their proximity to wetlands. And by wetlands, I mean anything from rivers to estuaries, floodplains to ponds. It's clear to see why we settled on wetlands. They provide easy access to water, rich agricultural land, and a way to navigate. But how else do cities and the people who inhabit them benefit from being close to wetlands. Beth Collier is a psychotherapist based in London who runs Wild in the City. She helps people in the city nurture a deeper connection with the natural world, focusing on addressing the imbalance of access to the outdoors, especially for people of colour. For all city dwellers, we're impacted by many health stresses, pollution, the greyness of the concrete, the noise, the hustle and bustle, the pace of the lifestyle. That impacts us all, putting stress on our nervous systems. We go into fight or flight at the most extreme end. Nature's like that wonderful antidote. It sets us up for perfect harmony for our internal rhythms, lowering our heart rate, lowering the stress hormone cortisol helping us to feel calm and more at peace, benefiting sleep and digestion. So it's really important to have natural spaces within cities so we can offset the harm that these really dysfunctional city spaces we've created for ourselves do to us. I was very lucky, I grew up rurally on a small holding and had a very immersive childhood where nature literally was on the doorstep and I spent my childhood sort of roaming, exploring in the fens and woodland, learning about what was living around me and, and feeling very much part of the natural landscape. Later on in life, when I moved into cities, I realised that for many people, nature wasn't normal. It was something alien and distant. And I realised there was perhaps something I could help offer in terms of a way of seeing and, and being with nature to support everyday life, to feel part of something bigger than ourselves. So I started Wild in the City as an organisation to help people nurture a deeper connection with the natural world. Beth leads walks into the countryside, provides therapy outdoors and teaches skills in woodcraft and wildlife identification. Her aim is to help people make nature a meaningful part of everyday life. Growing up as a black child in, in rural Suffolk, it, it was incredible to have such unlimited access to nature but socially it was very isolating and um, that there wasn't a black community and that's often the reverse experience of people I work with who've grown up within black and Asian communities perhaps with little access to nature so that there's something very cathartic and healing I think for all of us being in the space together enjoying not just nature but enjoying being part of a community of people of colour gathering in nature uh, something very healing, very connecting. So I feel very blessed that, that I have something that also nurtures me. I think for a lot of us that work in nature, we're, we're aware that by having constant access 
we're getting the benefits of, of being around our therapist, <laughs> being around a source of something that nourishes us and, and supports us. Really uh, feel, feel lucky and honoured to be enjoying community of nature but also a community of people in what I do. I'd really encourage people to whether you Google it or you have a more detailed map, just look at the green spaces and the blue spaces and see what's close by and go out and have an adventure, go out and explore. I mean, it really is one of the joys of most of the, the cities in the UK is that we, we do have fantastic spaces that are waiting for us to discover them. We don't have to go miles out to the countryside. It's such an exciting thing to do. It's a way of having fun and adventure discovering for ourselves what our favourite habitat is, how we feel in a woodland, how we feel in a wetland, what it's like to be in uh, open rolling hills. It really does lift the soul. I've never been here before, actually, so it's nice to explore somewhere different always. Quasia has experienced how being in nature can completely change your inner world. I'm Quasia also known as City Girl in Nature. We met Quasia at the London Wetland Centre, a special place on the edge of London which provides a safe haven for many local and migrating birds who travel up the Thames. It's also a respite for local people, an oasis at the heart of a city. David Attenborough, who opened the reserve, called it London's Extra Lung. Quasia is enamoured by the birds, like the parakeets, as they fill the air with the whir of their wings and the sounds of their calls as they streak across the sky. They're abundantly here. Um, I just recently learned a bit more about them, in fact. Um, they initially were brought here. They're native to Africa, South America, Pakistan and Northern India, which is interesting because I'm actually half Pakistani. So to <laughs> find that out is quite cool. But yeah, there's quite a lot of them and they're just perching everywhere, making noise. <laughs> Yeah, before I didn't really notice them as much. I grew up in Deptford, which is like an inner city area, which is in London. A lot of like me, my neighbours and my peers, we faced a lot of like different challenges, um, such as like losing friends to like knife crime and just like facing a lot of inequalities as well. I was a young carer for my grandma that lived with me. I lost her in like 2011. I then, in 2013, lost my auntie. She was murdered by my uncle, which is called like an honour killing. And then two years later, I actually lost my friend to knife crime. Um, so when I lost my friend, it then had like a massive effect on all the other things I had been, been facing. I didn't necessarily acknowledge that I was probably in a rough place because uh, a lot of people like me in my community, we face this stuff so it's normalised. You're kind of built off survival. You don't thrive. You don't really get an opportunity to change that narrative. But Kwasia's life was about to change. She was doing some work in her local youth club when she was introduced to Matt from the British Exploring Society he told her about an exciting opportunity to go on a trip to the Peruvian Amazon. So I was like, what? Yeah, definitely. I'm going to go along to this expedition despite like having these anxieties and fears of being different to everyone and people not understanding my experiences or feeling less than, than my peers or the people that I was around. With support from her local youth club, Quasia was able to go. After a brief training weekend, her group headed out on their epic journey. From Heathrow, it was three days of traveling and journeying through planes, boats, coaches to get into the jungle. When I arrived even, it was pitch dark with just loads of sounds. So that was like my icebreaker into the jungle. <laughs> Once there, they camped, explored and learnt about the wildlife. The biodiversity there is out of this world, even though it's in this world. Like crickets, frogs, birds, bats, everything. It was overwhelming, it was pitch dark, I couldn't see nothing as well. Plus there was mosquitoes also singing in my ears. 
Quasia was in awe of the possibilities of the natural world. Returning home, she was determined to use her experience to help others. When I came back from the Amazon, I was still so intrigued, more so with nature on a different level. And to then come back into a place of which is urban and hear the sounds that I'm used to, like the police sirens, <laughs> was interesting because I was still tapped into nature sounds because I'd spent so long in the jungle. So my body got in tune with a different frequency. I was then now like connecting with the sounds of the birds, looking up and around, not swatting insects anymore, <laughs> saving them in fact, saving spiders, mobs, everything. And just seeing the beauty of it enabled me to then have a different attitude towards it. So she created a YouTube series and called herself City Girl in Nature showing that anyone can connect to nature on their doorstep. One of the main reasons why I wanted us to meet art and stuff, because yeah. I wanted to let you know about some of the stuff that the outdoors and nature, how it can benefit us. So like, just generally, like right now, how we're walking, fresh air is really good for like mental well-being and our fitness, just yeah. like with sports. Another thing is that there's stuff that you can eat. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> there's stuff that you can eat outside. What, ready made? Yeah. So like for instance, <laughs> look at this. This is a blackberry, right? You see? How does it taste? It's nice, you taste it. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, look. Taste it. I'll, I'll have another one for you so that you feel safe. Very sweet though. <laughs> you didn't know that you could eat that, right? So look at the I'm see proud that? Look, look of myself one. now because I'm essentially what the younger me needed and it doesn't need to be at such the extreme end of what I've done with going to the Amazon or going on an expedition. It can just be on your doorstep. London Wetland Centre is in the heart of one of the world's busiest urban areas. In the shadow of Heathrow, the sound of planes are a constant reminder of the reserve's city location. For many, wetlands like this are a vital source of nature close to where they live. But how important are they for resident wildlife? Nick Oliver is the engagement manager and can tell us more. What the London Wetland Centre does is connect the Surrey Hills all the way up through to the Thames. We're part of a big, big corridor. So you go from the Surrey Hills to places like Wimbledon Common, Putney Heath, Barnes Common, than us. So we're part of that big, big corridor, which means you get um, freer movement of wildlife. Over the years, we've had some of the weird and wonderful avian visitors, things like glossy ibis, Pacific golden plover, pectoral sandpipers. Those are, those are pretty special to be in the UK. But it's other native species which have been massively on decline in the post war period. So for example, species like bittern. Bitterns have that distinctive boomy bass call you can hear in the background. Member of the heron family, very elusive, very shy, incredibly well camouflaged. You'd associate bitterns with the reed beds of the Norfolk Broads or the Somerset Levels or down on, on the south coast. You certainly wouldn't expect to see them in London. But each winter for about the last 15 or so years, Bitten have overwintered on site because they're following the Thames on their migration. So the Thames being a major bird motorway, a, a wildlife corridor, they're seeing the suitable habitat and they're hunkering down. So we, we have bitten regularly each and every year from about October through to February. And we've had lapwing breeding on site. They have been massively on the decline because of the use of insecticides killing off their, their food source, so they'll be rooting around for grubs in the soil. Those grubs aren't there anymore on the farmland. We now have lapwing breeding on site since the late 1990s, and that's the closest lapwing have bred to, to central London. As a Norfolk boy who grew up in the Broads, I've had better views of Bitten at the London Wetland Centre than I have back home. And that just shouldn't be. But as cheesy as it sounds, it's, it is quite literally the case of build it and they will come. And you create the right habitat, 
you create the access to that habitat by developing a reserve right by the Thames and the wildlife will follow. And wildlife is actually quite resilient and it will bounce back if you give it the opportunity. The London Wetland Centre has a busy population of birds. Waders, geese, ducks. But it hasn't always been that way. Before it was a dedicated nature reserve, it was four reservoirs used by Thames Water to provide London's growing population with fresh water. In the 1980s, Thames Water announced that they would be decommissioning the reservoirs. Peter Scott, the founder of the WWT, saw an opportunity to turn the area into a sanctuary for wildlife. In 1996, we started developing the site, draining the reservoirs down, breaking up all the concrete and reusing that to help shore up the car park and all the the, the main vista centre, and then all the clay, all the soil underlying that was used to reprofile the site, building up islands, building up banks, and once the, that aspect of the landscaping or waterscaping had been done, we went about the job of planting up trees, wildflowers, grasses across the site until opening to the public in 2000. And this has welcomed a range of wildlife to London that may have never come here otherwise. What a difference this kind of natural oasis could make to places like Sheffield, Newcastle or Manchester. Places where people are dealing with the stresses of city living, far removed from blue and green spaces. Urban wetlands are a balm to city living. I know that when I take a walk alongside a riverbank or sit by a pond, it gives a much bigger sense of well-being than going on a walk without any water. And I'm not alone. YouGov research, released by the Mental Health Foundation, has found 65% of people find being near water improves their mental well-being and is their favourite part of spending time in nature. For many who have no private garden, or even any means to leave the city, access to rivers and other wetlands are a lifesaver. Tom Ash is a policy and advocacy officer at the WWT and is working with the government to try and get more people access to wetlands in their cities. Previously, a lot of urban areas that were built on wetlands, you know, built around rivers, built around marshes, because you need that access to fresh water. But a lot of them have been covered up, closed over, or made concrete banks to streams, or just not in a good state. So it's about bringing those back in and then the benefits they can bring. So lots of studies have shown that access to nature and being in nature is really good for our mental health. And being in blue spaces is particularly good for our mental health. And actually some of those studies we've actually run here at London Wetland Centre. So we did one where we actually showed that even 10 minutes exposure in a blue space can sort of reduce native feelings. So it's really good for for direct mental health and it obviously provides opportunities for walking, cycling, active travel that can improve physical health. But there's also less obvious benefits, which, for example, resilience to climate change. So if you introduce more wetlands into urban areas, that can actually slow down water and store water, which means that when it rains really hard, that water's not going to spill onto the roads, spill into people's houses, because it's going to be absorbed into ground, held in those wetlands. So as we get more flooding with climate change, that's going to help there. And also, as we get more heat waves going forward, larger blue spaces can also provide a cooling effect. But it's not just about these big open wetland spaces. A lot of areas are densely built, and so they're just not always possible. So it's about building in smaller interventions. So, for example, we had a project in Slough where there was a stream that had been covered up, culvert it's called, where it just goes underground. And we unearthed that and dug sort of side channels, planted wetland plants and brought it more close to its natural way that it would have been. That brought back loads of wildlife. We had fish in there, had herons, kingfishers came back. 
and that also provides a flooding benefit because those side channels and the, the vegetation can absorb water during heavy flow and stop flooding of the park. And there's potential to do that everywhere. Every new development could have small linear wetlands which absorb water and, and provide a habitat for wildlife. You can have the rain gardens. So there's all sorts of small level things that you can do to bring wetlands back into the urban environment where they would have been there previously and all of that provides these multiple benefits talking about in terms of mental well-being, providing opportunities for active travel, preventing flooding, cooling. Once you add up those smaller interventions and the bigger blue spaces like London Wetlands Centre then you really get all the benefits for the urban population. Having these natural spaces people can escape to is really, you can see it here, you know, there's a really great spot here at London Wetlands Centre and I think there's a placard saying it's one of our favourite spots but you can see why, you just look out on this pond and it's just really tranquil and it is, yeah, it's hard to hold those native emotions if you really sort of immerse yourself in the space. Waterlands is a series brought to you by the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. It's an 1860 production and the producer is Eliza Lomas. Head to www.org.uk to find out more.